Amen. God bless you, dear brother. I love that song. I sing because. I hope you have a song in your heart. And um, I'm, I'm so glad to be here. Listen, I want you to know that I have thoroughly enjoyed this time here. Preacher, pastor, God bless you. Thank you for allowing me to come. It's been my privilege to be here. And you have encouraged me so much. And your pastor is such an encouragement. I thank God for him. And um, I tell everybody I know, this is a great place to go. If you can get your snowsuit, come on up. <laughs> and, um, but honestly, can you believe right here in this place, God's done such a wonderful work. I've had an opportunity to meet many of the folk who live in Fargo outside the church and talk to them. And I want you to know that it's just a great place all the way around. It's just outstanding. And um, I, was, um, I was thinking about, you know, why people don't come to church. Many years ago, we did a survey, or not us, but there was a survey done on why people do not go to church. Why don't you go to church? They asked people, don't go to church. Why don't you go to church? And they, they gave several reasons, and they summed them up into four categories. The number one reason people say they don't go to church is because they say churches are not friendly. They don't feel welcome. The second reason people say they don't go to church is because they say church is boring. The third reason people say they don't go to church, and we're not talking about people here, but the third reason people say they don't go to church is because they don't understand what's going on. And the fourth reason that people gave for not going to church is they say there's just nothing over there for me or my family. And I want you to know that right here, Fargo Baptist Church, this is a welcoming place. Not only is it friendly, but you can find a friend. And you ought to tell people, take away these objections. Say, I want to invite you to the friendliest place you've ever been this side of heaven, Fargo Baptist Church. And encouraging services, even when they have guest preachers sing. Just a great, great spirit in the services. And I think you pretty much get everything your preacher, pastor preaches on. It's pretty, pretty right square to the Bible. Practical preaching you can incorporate into your everyday life. I've listened to several things that he's done online and, and things he explains on the Ten Commandments and things. I thought, I've told him for my friends, you need to listen to what he says about the Ten Commandments. So simple. I mean, my goodness. You can get it. And there is something here for everybody. Listen to all the announcements I've made, you know, and the different things. And this church works as hard as any church I've ever been in my life at ministering to every age of people and reaching every group of people in this area. It's fascinating. There's so much going on here with people reaching this city and this part of the country and ministering to these people. Now, people don't know that. It's a friendly place, encouraging services, practical preaching, and there is something for you. Now, if you'll say those things, you're going to be shocked at the response you get from people. You know, the world is changing. Did you know that? I mean, it's changing real fast, faster than you could ever dream. You know, we read in the Word of God where the Bible says, by the way, I'm going to preach in just a moment in Acts chapter number one. You can go ahead and turn there. But we read in the Word of God where Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah. My goodness. A lot of things about that. The world is changing fast to become like Sodom and Gomorrah. How many know that? It's real. It's real. It's, the world's changing. But not only is the world changing, becoming like Sodom and Gomorrah, but God's people are changing rapidly like Lot. So that's a two-sided coin. It's not just the world, it's God's people are changing. I believe with all of my heart 
that we're living in a more minded world, a lot minded believers living in a more minded world. And we better do something. Things are changing. We need to come back to the Word of God and back to what the Bible says. I, I, I humor myself. I like to write things, and I don't know, I just enjoy writing. My wife has always given me early morning. I'm an early riser. I get up usually around quarter to five or something, and I study and write, and I just love it. It's quiet time. And um, I write things, and I like to write songs. I like to write poetry. I, like to, I certainly like to write sermons. And then I write some political humor. Now, you have to be careful when you write political humor. You know, they, I have a famous brother in Knoxville, Tennessee, named Dr. Clarence Sexton. So when I write political humor, I have to use my pen name, which, which is Johnny Pasquacco. <laughs> I called my brother one day, and one of the secretaries answered, and I said, is, is the pastor there? She said, no, he's not. Can I take a message? I said, sure. Tell him Johnny Pasquacco called him and liked to talk to him. She said, how do you spell that name? I said, J-O-H-N-N-Y, and the last name spelled just like it's pronounced. <laughs> Pasquacco. And Johnny Pasquacco writes political humor, not Tom Sexton. You understand that, right? And, uh, just so much stuff, you know. I have to be careful because I could just go off and, and be gone for, talk about that for an hour. We wrote a little poem entitled, Things Are Changing. Things are changing, that's for sure. What was once very simple is now no more. We read where our politicians are back at it again. Now they cannot tell us who are women and who are men. In my day, that call was made at birth. But these new gender laws make you think, what on earth? Can you imagine me telling my football coach, Mad Dog McQueen, that Jim, our all-state lineman, now goes by Jasmine? Or that Jim, our 6'9 quarterback, is now Ginger, that hideous-looking marching band majorette? Now, they both say they're living their lifelong dream and plan to compete in college on the women's swim team. Yeah, things are changing. And you know it's true. If we don't get back to doing God's work, our nation is through. Do you believe that? Now don't you tell anybody who Johnny Pasquacco is. I'll have to find it out. <laughs> hey, I like it, don't you? I am enjoying life. You might as well enjoy it and enjoy life, and I love it, I love it, I just love it. I love God's people. I'm, I can't hardly believe that I got in on this, to be honest with you. I'm just so surprised God saved me, and God's given me something to do with my life. Now, tonight we're going to do something a little different in the service, because tonight it's church participation for the message. How many are up for it? Oh, no, 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 no. How many are up for it? Say a hearty Amen. All right, so later on you'll understand where you're going to participate, but I need you to help me preach the sermon tonight. It's very important. Now I want you to turn with me, if you would please, to the, the book of Acts chapter number one. Acts chapter number one and verse number eight. Acts chapter one, verse number eight. I heard John R. Rice preach a few occasions before he went on to be with the Lord Dr. John O'Reilly, what a powerful preacher. I heard him preach a sermon one night on the yees and wees of the Bible. And I'll tell you something, that was the most fascinating thing. And when he got through that sermon, I said, I am so glad I'm one of the yees and wees of God's word. Can you imagine all the promises and all the things that God tells us? Now in Acts chapter number one, verse number eight, you're going to see one of the yees, and there's yees tonight, is you and me. Now watch. And ye. Has everybody got it? This is you. And ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. 
And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Now the word of God says that ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses. You know, I learned from my beloved pastor, Dr. Lee Robertson, it's more important to be a faithful witness than it is to be a good soul winner. Sometimes good soul winners don't talk to people. They only talk to people who are lost. But a faithful witness will speak to everyone. And God wants us to be faithful witnesses. As a matter of fact, he gives us the power to be a witness. Now, I believe that one of the things we have lost in our generation, and especially this day, is the power of a personal testimony. So I want to speak tonight on this subject, the power of your transformed life. The power of your transformed life. Now I want you to pray, and pray God to help us tonight. And I want you to pray that when the last amen is said, we might leave here more determined than ever before to make a difference in our world, beginning right here in your Jerusalem far ago. Amen. Father, thank you again for your goodness. Help us tonight, dear Lord. I pray that you might anoint me fresh and new with your spirit. Help me to say the things, dear Lord, that would be pleasing to you. But Lord, more important, speak to the hearts of people. Speak to my heart. Open our minds and heart of understanding that we might see truth. And Lord Jesus, tonight when we leave here, may we do with our lives what's pleasing to you. And we'll thank and praise you. For we ask it in Jesus' name, for his sake. Amen. The power of your life, your transformed life. You know, the word of God says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, when you trusted Christ as your personal Savior, God made you a brand new creature. God changed you from the inside out. Now, when I got saved, I got, I mean, I just, I couldn't believe what God had done for me. God changed my life. And I knew God had done something for me. And the more I yielded to God, the more God Help me be more like Jesus. I told you what my mother said, my dear little mother, and you have to know my mother, raising my brother, myself, and two sisters just like us. My little mother, four foot 11, 90 pounds, just a Tasmanian devil when it came to keeping you on track. She said, you know, Tommy, I wanted you to get a little religion, but you got way too much. <laughs> By the way, before she went home, to, before she ended her life, she got way too much. <laughs> she became a faithful witness for God. And I had the joy of seeing her grow in the Lord and marking her Bible in her own private reading and making notes in the Word of God and how God spoke to her heart. She would call me and say, Tommy, I got this boy I need to go talk to about Jesus. Can you come over and go with me? I said, Sure. I figured we're going to go see some 12 or 13-year-old boy, and we're going to see a 50, 60-year-old man. <laughs> said, well, this is not a boy, this is a man. She said, well, he's a boy to me, and he needs God. <laughs> but we had such a great time. But I watched how God used her, and I saw how the Lord used her, and it thrilled me to see that. It thrilled me. I gave my brother her Bible when she went home to be with the Lord, and uh, he cherishes that, and especially all those things about she marked in the Bible. It was interesting. Now, she'd just been saved 10 years. But boy, she got some, she redeemed some time in those 10 years. And one of the greatest things that happened in her life was she learned how to tell people what God had done for her. And you know, I discovered there are a lot of Christians that do not know how to tell people what happened in their life. They just don't know how to explain it. You know, uh, I remember when I got saved. Now, when I got saved, I wanted to tell everybody what God had done, but I didn't know. I didn't know how to tell people. 
I said, boy, I got a dose of something at church. And they said, what'd you get? I said, I got God. I didn't know how to explain it. I just got something. And then someone helped me to be able to explain and tell people what God had done for me. And I'll tell you, it transformed my life. And we, all these years, we've done it all over the world. We've done it in different nations we've gone to. One of the first things I like to do with Christians is to help them explain what God has done in their life. I want them to tell the story of Jesus and how he changed your life. Would you like to be able to do that? Now, that was a weak amen. Would you like to be able to do that? Now, I want you to write down some things. It's important you write this down. Number one... When you're talking about your life, now remember, the Bible says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, when you talk to people about your life and what God has done for you, begin by this. Write this down. My life before receiving Christ. Say that with me, would you please? My life. Oh, no. I guess say it a little louder. Everybody ready? My life. Now, I want you to write down some things. I want you to write down things that people can relate to. So often people will talk about their life like they were the worst devil that ever lived. And, you know, they talk about, oh, well, before I got saved, I drank a case of beer before breakfast and I'd go rob a store and blah, blah, blah. And people say, well, but if I ever get as bad as you, I'll do what you did. But the truth of the matter is, it's not how bad we are, it's how good God is, and we can't go to heaven in our merit. Nobody can be good enough to go to heaven. Do you believe that? So you got to explain to people what God did for you. So write this down. My life before receiving Christ. There was an emptiness in my life. Something was missing. I tell people sometimes, my life was like a merry-go-round, around and around and around and around. I was busy at it, but getting nowhere. Sometimes I'll say, because we live in an affluent city, and sometimes I'll say to people, you know, I had everything to live with, but I just didn't have anything to live for. I'll say quite often, I tried everything this world offered to fill that emptiness, and I can tell you something, it didn't work. My life was empty. Something was missing in my life. Now, everyone knows what that missing is, right? Number two, how I became a Christian. Say that with me. How I became a Christian. Now, what's important about that? What's important is you must include the Bible because the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. You must hear and believe the gospel to be saved. Do you believe that tonight? So, you got to talk about how you became a Christian. Now, I'm not talking about preaching to people. I'm talking about how you became a child of God. Now, you have to be careful when you're talking to someone who doesn't know the Bible because a lot of people are, are totally ignorant of the Bible. They know very little about it. So, you got to be careful not quoting it but you're going to make reference to it because later on you're going to get a chance to take the Word of God and show them how to know Jesus. So you need to say things that people can relate to. You need to say, before I came to know the Lord, there was an emptiness in my life, no peace, no direction. My life had no purpose. It was like a merry-go-round, going around and around and around. I just couldn't find that missing thing. Tried everything the world had to offer, but to be honest with you, it left me empty. And then one day, somebody took a Bible and showed me how to have peace and purpose for my life. Now, people say, do you believe the Bible? I do. You know why? Because I did what the Bible said do to have peace and purpose. And I want to tell you something. It worked. It worked. Now, we're going to take the Bible and talk to people how to know God. We're going to go through the plan of salvation. But you're doing something. You're sharing your testimony. You're talking to people about what God did for you, how God transformed your life. You remember the Gadarene maniac? He's one of my favorite characters in the Bible. He got saved. Reminds me a lot of 
Brother Fern, you know, Vermin, he, you know, he reminds me a lot of him. Crazy, wild, running around, cutting himself, screaming, hollering. Now I'm kidding about it. And one day he met Jesus and God saved him. Hallelujah. And delivered him and created in him a brand new person. And he wanted to be with Jesus. You remember when he said, I want to go with you. Let me go. And Jesus said, no, 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 this is not for you. By the way, God's got a purpose for everybody, doesn't he? But here's what Jesus said. Return to your own house and family and your friends and tell them what God had done for thee. He didn't say go tell them what you want to do for me. He didn't say go preach to them. Just go tell people what I have done for you. And I promise you that stirs the hearts of people to know that. I want you to know when we talk to people about our faith and how God changed our life, we have to be careful not to portray ourselves as the worst dog that ever came out of the ditch. We got to be careful to talk about how God changed our life because it's the Bible and the Spirit of God and we know that, but people don't understand that. But they do understand this. I did what the Bible said do and it worked changed my life. Now people say, well, what did it say? We'll tell you that in a minute. And number three, write it down. This is so very important. What Jesus means to me today. Say that with me, would you? What, what Jesus means to me today. Now what does the Lord Jesus mean to you today? Have you ever thought about it? Have you ever thought about people would like to know what it means to be a Christian? What's it like being a Christian? Now, they don't have no idea. They have no idea. They do not have a clue what it's like being a child of God. People have no idea what it's like to have a, a family, a Christian family. They have no idea what it's like to have a pastor that loves you and watches for your soul. They have no idea what it means to have people you love and people that love you. They have no idea what it's like to have a home where the Spirit of Christ is. And so you have to be able to explain to people, since that day, my life has been totally changed. Now, by the way, let me say this. I believe that a faith that doesn't change your life is a faith that will not save your soul. Because the Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. And so God changed so much about my life. That emptiness, God filled. That, that lack of peace, God's given me peace. And here's an amazing thing. God has given me a purpose for my life. God has given me a purpose. Do you know, God wants unsaved people to know four great truths. I just want to share this with you real quick. Four great truths. God created people with a need, a deep need. And here's man's greatest need. Number one, a need to be loved. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you live. You can, wherever it is, anywhere in the world. I've been in places that I can't imagine God said, let me go to them in Africa, in the Congo, in the jungle, in Asian places, in the Middle East. I've met people from every walk of life, every language, and I can tell you something. I've never met a human being that did not have a need to be loved. People want to be loved. Number two, God created people with a need of worth. I've known people, and I'm sure you have too, who have been very successful in business, done well. Maybe, maybe they were a celebrity and, and were famous, a famous actor. Maybe they were sports in sports. They were great sportsmen. But I'll tell you something. Those things don't satisfy. The Bible says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. But you know, people need to feel of worth. They need to feel of worth. I mean, people feel like they're failures. They feel like they're not worth it. They may be multimillionaires, 
but they don't feel of worth. Number three, God made people with a need for hope. They need hope. They need to know that this is going to be okay. Life's going to be okay. People need hope. They need it bad. They've lost hope. The Word of God says they're, they're in the world without God and without hope. No hope. You know, the people have, they've, been, they've heard that people have, the doctors say, you got cancer. Wow. Or something else happened. No hope. No hope. But I'll tell you something. God wants people to have hope. And number four, these are the four greatest needs of unsaved people. Number four, people need a real purpose for life. I'm talking about a purpose that lasts a lifetime, a purpose. Now that's people's greatest need. I don't care where you go, I don't care who it is, I don't care what language they speak, what their background is, what their religion is, you can speak to people's hearts by speaking about those four things, love, Worth, hope, and purpose. And here's an amazing thing. God says in one powerful verse, for God so loved the world. You can tell people, God loves you, friend. The Bible says, for God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son, that's how precious you are. That's how valuable you are. That's your worth. God says, I gave Jesus for you. Can you imagine giving his only begotten son? That's our worth. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Hey, now that's hope, friend. Should not perish. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I discovered a long time ago that Christians don't go through a valley when they die. They leave this body and step into God's presence. Wow. Isn't that something? Do you know Jesus said you'll never see death if you're a child of God? You'll never taste death if you're a child of God? And Jesus said you'll never die. One of the oldest questions in the Bible is one Job asked, if a man dies, shall he live again? God didn't answer that question for Job. But when Jesus was on this earth in John chapter 11, he said, I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. You got that, Joseph? Uh, Job? Never die. God's people live forever. Now that's hope. Is that hope to you? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now that's a purpose for a life. I'm going to live forever. Now if God's given me eternal life, then he's going to give me something to do, not just in this world, but in the world to come. Do you understand? People around the world would love to hear what you just heard. They'd give anything to hear it. People in Fargo, North Dakota, would give anything to hear. That they're loved, they're of worth, they can have hope, and their life can have purpose. Right? My life before receiving Christ, how I became a Christian, and what Jesus means to me now, he's given me a purpose for my life. Wow. You got it? How many got it? Point one is what? My what? Point one? No, point one is my life before. Point two? Point three? Now let's all stand, if you would. Let's stand. It's time for participation. And we're going to have fun. Now, here's what I want you to do. In the balcony, all over this great church, I want you to do something. I want you to look around and find somebody. Find somebody. It'd be nice if you found somebody you didn't know, but if you have to talk to somebody you know, okay.
but it'd be a lot better if you didn't. So here's what I'd really like for you to do. I'd like for ladies to find ladies and men to find men. Ready? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you 15 seconds to do that. Find someone. Ready? It starts. And by the way, I'll tell you, can you just play a little something while they're finding people? Come on now. Time's ticking. Time's ticking. Got to find somebody. Quick, quick, quick. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Find somebody. Oh, my goodness. We're getting close to... Have you found somebody? Have you found somebody? Okay. Now you have found somebody. Okay? How many have found a partner? Now I want one of you to raise your hand. One of the partners raise your hand. Just one. Raise your hand. Big and high. I got to see it. Ready? The other one gets to go first. All ready? Now, now listen, you got 60 seconds. 60 seconds. That's an elevator ride. 60 seconds to tell the person next to you what your life was like before Christ, how you became a Christian, and what Jesus means to you now that you're a child of God. Ready, get set, go. Twenty seconds left. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Time. Now the other one gets to tell. Ready? Get set. Go. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Time's up. Play a little music now. Find your way back. Find your way back. God bless you. You can be seated. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now, I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you a question. How many heard something that really stirred your heart? Come on, let me lift your hand. Don't be ashamed. Now, that's you're telling another Christian. And it, it encouraged people just to hear how God changed your life. Now, I get people to write their testimony out and to go over and over, and I help them with it, I go through it and give it, I boil it down to just as brief as possible. And I always put it aside because if something ever happens to them, I read what they said about God. But the most important thing we do is obey God. Now we just heard the preacher talk about it. The Bible says, but you shall receive power, I thought the Holy Ghost had on you, and you shall be witnesses witnesses in other words you're to tell the story of Jesus and how God changed your life what you just did in 60 seconds could change the world and certainly change this great city you could do it now I want you to I want to give you a couple of things to write down number one your testimony has the power to create a desire in the hearts of people to want to know Jesus. 
It has the power to create a desire. The Lord Jesus said, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Do you know the woman at the well I mentioned before? I love, I love the story and the conversion of the woman at the well. Twelve disciples went to her village. Twelve Baptist preachers, one of them was the devil, went to her village, did business with people, passed her on the way, didn't tell one person that the creator of the world is right out here. The savior of the world's out here. They did not know how to talk to people and help people want to know Jesus. But a woman who got saved and knew what God had done in her life went to that village and created a desire for every human being in that village to come and meet Jesus. The power of a personal testimony. That's what one person can do. It just takes one. On the job, in school, wherever God has planted you, just tell people what God has done for you and look what God will do with your testimony. You have the power, you, to create a desire in the hearts of people to want to know God. People say, well, I'd like for my family to know God. Well, why don't you create the desire in their heart? Because God has given you the power to do that. You have. Not the preacher, not the choir, not the special music, but God has empowered every believer to be a witness and to stir the hearts of people to want to know God. Man, can you imagine? If God's people could just get a hold of it, if they could just get a hold of this, I can create a desire for people to want to know God. My, one of our men, who's the director of outdoor evangelism, and I were having breakfast in a restaurant in Fort Myers, and we were sitting there, it was just cram packed with people, you know, like a restaurant. So here you, you wait in line to get a seat, and then, then it's a rush, 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 rush. And we're sitting there talking about what we're trying to do to get the gospel outdoors in places. That's what we do, a lot of it. And we're sitting there, and all of a sudden, a lady and her husband and daughter got up. And uh, they're going out the door, and the lady stopped at the door, and she says, the restaurant is packed with people. Conversations are going. She said, excuse me, can I have your attention? I just want everybody to know that God changed my life, and the Jesus that saved me will save you too. And I'm leaving some brochures here at the cash register. I'd love for you to get one before you leave. And I said to Mark, man, I want to go get one of those brochures. Can you believe this one? She stirred the hearts of people to want to know God. One of our ladies was in a, I told that story. She was standing there and she said, if anybody here would like to know Jesus, I have plenty of time to talk to you before I leave. I'm going to be sitting right over here. And she said, one girl walked over and said, I want to know him. I want to know him. See, God made us, and God has given us the ability to desire things. We can get consumed with desire, and God has given his children power to create a desire in the hearts of people to want to know God. God has given you the power. I'm going to hurry here. God has given you the power to cause people to examine their own life. The Bible said, examine yourselves and whether you be in the faith or not. God wants people to examine their life. Let a man examine himself, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28. Examine him. How many have ever had an examination? Not by, I mean, you know, a lot, most of us have. And listen, would you like to get somebody to do a self-examination? Well, here's the way God made people. Ready? God made people to relate what they hear to themselves. That's the way God made us. I kid people all the time. I said, and my wife says, oh, he's not really kidding that much. I'm a bit of a hypochondriac, and I, I really am. I can visit the hospital, go see somebody that had a heart attack, and I say, honey, I, I feel like I need to go get checked out before I leave. 
She says, you quit that. It's terrible when I go see a lady that's having a baby, I'm telling you right now. Oh, my goodness, I know the pain, you know. But it's just that way. I, I can't hardly, I can't hardly say. I see somebody that's cut. My little girl, when she was a baby, cut herself real bad on the throat. My daughter, my wife had her other daughter in the, in the waiting room, and I went back in the emergency room with a doctor. He's going to stitch up Michelle, and I'm standing there, and I'm calming her down. They got her strapped, you know, to a table because she's little. She's screaming and crying, and I'm saying, sweetheart, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Just relax. Just relax. And so the doctor wanted to see how serious the wound was, and he opened it up. That's the last thing I remember. I was, honestly, I was on the floor. They took me out in the lobby and said, don't come back here. They took my wife and I said, wow. Now, you have to be trained in the medical profession not to relate what you see to yourself. That's the way God made us. That's the way God made us. And when you say to somebody, before I came to know the Lord, there was an emptiness in my life. I had no peace, no purpose, no direction. They're listening to you. And they're thinking, well, you know, I have an emptiness in my life. I have an emptiness in my life. That's why it's very important not to brag on sin, but just talk about the emptiness without God. No hope, no purpose. You have the power, you, you do, to cause someone to examine themselves. Wherever you choose to say, you can be in a school and you can say, you know, before I came to know the Lord, oh my goodness, there was such emptiness in my life. No purpose, no peace, no direction. Oh, there's so many things I tried to fill that emptiness with, but I kept coming up empty. You know what people are going to do? Everybody that hears you, every single person that hears you is going to think about their own life and the emptiness they have. And when you say someone took a Bible and showed me how I could feel that emptiness and have a life with purpose, I'm so glad somebody cared enough about me to take a Bible and show me. They're going to sit there and think, well, nobody's shown me. Even if they're religious, nobody's shown me. Nobody's shown me. It's human nature to relate what you hear to yourself. It causes people to examine their own personal life. Now look, God has given you, you, the power to get people to examine their life, see whether in faith. Number three, your testimony has the power to destroy the works of the devil. Now that may seem odd to you, but the Bible teaches us in Psalm 23 or 22, 23, you figure it out. That God inhabits the praise of Israel. How many have ever read that? Good. You know it's in the Bible. <laughs> you know I'm at that age where I forget some things. But God inhabits the praise of Israel. God inhabits the praise of his children. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 3, verse number 8, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. That's what the Bible says. God inhabits the praise of his people. When you start talking about Jesus, guess what? He shows up. Now, he's always with us. He's in us. He's here. But when, you start, when I heard the brother singing tonight, God bless you, brother, I felt the presence of God. Did you feel God's presence? I mean, God's presence. And you know what? When God manifests his presence, the works of the devil destroy. Let me show you. I want to show you tonight that you already know you have this power and don't realize it. How many people in this auditorium tonight, you've had somebody apologize to you because they said something bad, maybe took the Lord's name in vain, or they said something, they said, I'm sorry. How many of that's ever happened? Hold them big and high. Now look around, preacher, look around. 
These are people that manifest the presence of Christ and the works of the devils being destroyed around you. You see how it works? Here's one of the devil's works. By the way, he's got a lot of them. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 3, If our gospel be hid, it's hid to them at lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of those which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The devil has a stronghold. People can't see. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 4, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God pulling down the stronghold. What is the weapon? What's the weapons of our warfare? Everybody ought to want to know what that is. Well, one, it's our personal testimony. It's the word of God that pulls down the stronghold. So here's somebody blinded by the devil. They just don't see it. They just don't see the simplicity of the gospel. They don't see how it all works. And so you say, well, I'm trying to get them to understand. I'm trying to get these people to see what I'm trying to... They, they just don't understand. Well, why don't you use the power God gave you? Why don't you pull down the stronghold so they can see the gospel? So how do you do that? Before I came to know the Lord, there was an emptiness in my life. I had no purpose, no peace, no joy. My life was a merry-go-round, and one day somebody took the Bible and showed me how I could feel that emptiness. When you say that with the power of God on your life, God has given you the power to pull down the stronghold. Just a moment ago, you raised your hand and testified that God has given you the power to stop some evil words in your presence. Don't you know God wants to use his power to pull down the stronghold in your presence? That's why we should give a testimony. Because the word of God and the power of a Christian can manifest the presence of Christ. And when Jesus is manifested, the works of the devil is destroyed. Oh my goodness. I, 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 I could... I could spend an hour on that. I preached a message on the works of the devil and how we destroy them. Just study and you'll find out that God has given us the weapons of warfare. We don't use them. Now here's a weapon we don't use. We don't use the power of a testimony. And that's what turned the world upside down. That's what they did in the, in the book of Acts. First century Christianity was, was about telling people what Jesus did and they turned their world upside down. Now we have Christians who won't even talk about Jesus. We have Christians who are shy, afraid because the works of the devil are so manifested now. You say, well, if I say something, they're going to come at me with knives. Oh, they may, but there's going to be somebody the stronghold comes down and you're going to be able to get the gospel to them and they're going to be able to believe. Our testimony has the power to prepare people to receive the word of God. Now look, the Bible says, let your light so shine before men. I'm going to hurry and say this. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's in Matthew chapter 5. The Bible says, let your light so shine before men they may see your good works. The Bible says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God's word is his light. Say that with me, would you? God's word, it's his light. Your word is your light. My mother used to say, my brother and I get in trouble she said, all right, boys, one of you shed a little light on this thing. She's trying to figure out who's going to get the whipping. Somebody better start talking, she'd say. But she, her terminology was, shed a little light on this. How many know what I'm talking about? Your words are your light. God's words, his light, your words, your light. The Bible said, let your light so shine before men. 
your light, that they may see your good works. Now, we know there are no good works in us. The only good work is what Jesus has done. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 1, verse number 6, He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ. The good work is what God is doing and has done and is doing in your life. Are you still with me? So the Bible says, take your light, your words, and put on what God is doing. Take your words and put on what God is doing now listen to this. Let your light so shine before men they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Do you know what brings glory to God? People getting saved. John chapter number 4, a verse I mentioned on, I think, when, uh, Tuesday night. In John, excuse me, in John chapter 11, when Jesus came, he said this, the Mary and Martha sent for him, he said, this sickness is not in death, but it's for the glory of God. Well, what does that mean? Well, read on. You get toward the end of the chapter and you find out that the Jews which came to Mary and Martha's house when Lazarus was brought back from the dead believed on him. That's what brought glory to God. People believing, people getting saved. God has given you the power not only to create a desire in the hearts of people. God's given you a power to take away the objection. God's given you a power to manifest His presence, pull down the stronghold, and God has given you the power to prepare people to hear the Word of God. They're ready for it. Can you imagine what it would be like to, for your pastor to get up on Sunday morning and preach the gospel after you've prepared a dozen or two dozen people with your testimony to be in the service? How many have ever seen someone, now watch, you've ever seen someone who got saved and the next service they brought somebody with them? Come on, raise your hand. You know what that is? That's the power of their testimony. They went to work and they started saying, man, I went over there and, whoo, I can't believe what happened. I got saved. Where? Well, you can go with me if you want to. God changed my life and my, my joy. Hey, listen. It works. A child of God has the power to create a desire in someone, pull down the stronghold, prepare them for the Word of God, and to bring them to the house of God. They're sitting here ready. What's next? Their heart is prepared for preaching. Do you know that's what made the great Highland Park Baptist Church the great church? Now, Dr. Robertson was a great preacher. Don't misunderstand me. But I'm going to tell you something. I sat there and watched them for years. I was there nine and a half years. I watched people in the pew. I sat on the platform for many of those years. I would watch people in the pew have their friends with them. I would see the conviction come and the power of God manifested. These people brought their friends or neighbors or loved ones to church with them, and God got a hold of their heart. And invitation time sometimes is like a crusade. It's unbelievable The people would get saved. And you say, what's the secret? The secret is, out in the highways and hedges, they're telling people about Jesus. They're telling people about Jesus. One of our men got saved, and he was a roofer. And um, he was working on a roof, and he got one of our CDs with our, our quartet singing. He was playing it on the roof while he was working, putting tile on and a neighbor came out and said, hey, what kind of music is that? And he's a new Christian. He said, it's Christian music. It's our church music. He said, that's interesting. Then later on, he came over and he said, well, where, do you, where do they have that music at? He said, well, I'll be honest with you. He said, I just, I just got saved. I'm, 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 I'm a new Christian, but our church has great music. I went there and, and God, God changed my life. And I got saved. He said, well, where's it located? He said, it's over here in such and such. He said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to come. I'd like to come. So Tony told me about it. He said, I talked to a man. He said, he's going to be here. And so when he came in, I, I recognized him. Said, That's him. I preached a simple gospel message. He came down the aisle and got saved. And he said, I want to I I I get saved. And so his name was Dave. 
He got saved, got baptized. He's a member of our church for many years, and he and his wife, and they've moved on. And we didn't know that Dave was in AA. We didn't know that. We didn't have time to talk to him about that. It was just boom, you know. And so he went to his AA meeting on Monday. He walked in. You know how the kids sit around. Everybody has a testimony, has something to say. Dave spoke up and said, listen, I'm not going to be back. I found what I've been looking for. I got saved. I went to Gulf Coast Baptist Church and heard a pastor named Sexton, and I, I got saved. And you won't be seeing me anymore. God bless you. Boom, gone. Tuesday, the phone rang. The secretary said, hold on a minute. Put the man on line. He said, I've been calling churches in town. Is this the church where such and such came on Sunday? I said, yes. He said, are you there? I said, yes. He said, I'll be there right away. I thought, who is this guy? He come walking in the door. He said, this is where Dave came. I said, yeah. He said, I want what Dave got. I want what Dave got. I said to one of my sisters, I believe you can leave this with the good Lord. That new Christian stirred up a heart, a desire for somebody to want to be saved. Can you imagine, can you imagine what this great crowd of Christians can do in this city just by telling people what God has done in your life? Oh my goodness, we'd be reading about a movement of God in Fargo, North Dakota. And it's in your hands, it's your power. You can do it, you can create it. And God's given you such a wonderful church to bring people to. Listen, don't lose this opportunity God's given you. Churches have their moment, they have their window, they have a time when God does something. And dear friend, this is your moment. People are hungry to know God. Don't believe what you hear about people. They can't find enough of this world to feel that emptiness inside of them. But you know what they need, right? My life before receiving Christ, how I became a Christian, what Jesus means to me, and I want you to know him. I sang a song before the service called The Haven of Rest. The generation, the generation that brought us to where we are, the Christians, understood the power of a personal testimony. And they wrote hymns and psalms so they not only could preach it, but they could sing it. Think about this song. My life before receiving Christ. My soul in sad exile was out on life's sea, so burdened with sin and distress, till I heard a sweet voice saying, make me your choice. And I entered the haven of rest. How I became a Christian. I yielded myself to his tender embrace and faith taking hold of God's word. My fetters fell off and I anchored my soul. The haven of rest is my Lord. Now that I'm a Christian, the song of my soul since the Lord made me whole has been the old story so blessed how Jesus will save whosoever will have a home in the heaven of rest. I plead for people to come. Oh, come to the Savior. He patiently waits to save by his power divine. Come anchor your soul in the haven of rest and say, Thy beloved is mine. Sing the chorus with me, would you? I've anchored my soul in the haven of rest. I'll sail the wild seas 
no more. The tempest may sweep o'er oh, the wild stormy deep, but in Jesus I'm safe evermore. Do you know that that hymn book is filled with powerful songs that prepare people to hear the glorious gospel of Christ. This is not a message I came up with. This is a message that's been handed down from generation to generation to generation. They handed it down in song so we would never forget it. The power, the power of a transformed life to stir the hearts of people, to bring people to God. Dear friend, that is our work.